Well, today we are starting a new series called SOGI, uh, which stands for Sexual Observations from God's Instructions. Uh, and in this series, we are going to explore what God says in his word about the uh, entire LGBTQ movement and, and everything that that movement uh, stands for. Uh, many of you know that June in our culture is known as Pride Month, the month where we celebrate all things LGBTQ+. And in our school system, this teaching falls under the umbrella acronym, also known as SOGI, which stands for Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. And so over the next month, uh, we are going to graciously and, and hopefully tactfully look at what God has to say about sexual orientation and gender identity and why it's so important that we approach this huge topic from God's perspective because, friends, the consequences are huge. It is life-changing, life-altering uh, if we get this wrong. Uh, but before we get into things, uh, I want to recognize this is a hot topic. Okay, this, this is a, a very controversial subject. Uh, I know that some of you are already kind of squirming in your seats a little bit or you're, you know, kind of feeling a little bit apprehensive. Um, and that's okay, right? It's okay to be a little bit uncomfortable. Oftentimes, God convicts us and challenges us, and, and that will make us uncomfortable. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we do, sorry, that we address this topic uh, with love and grace. Uh, I have friends and family members who identify as LGBTQ. Uh, in fact, I had a roommate in Bible college who struggled with same-sex attraction, and it was a very big wrestle for him. Uh, I also know that some of you either identify as LGBTQ or you have friends and family members that do. And so before we get started, I want to highlight a couple of, uh, let's call them important reminders that will shape how we should approach this topic. And so first, first we need to remember that all people are valuable and should be loved. Okay, all people are valuable and should be loved. Uh, no matter what lifestyle, orientation, gender identity, or the choices that people make, all people are loved by God, and therefore we are called to love and respect everyone. In Genesis 1.27, at the very beginning of the Bible, we're told that God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And so that means that all people, every single person, is made in the image of God. Which means that every single person has innate value and worth. And because of that value... We are called to love everyone. That was one of the main messages that Jesus taught. In fact, one of Jesus' closest friends and followers, the Apostle John, wrote in 1 John 4, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Friends, that is a huge call to love, right? We are called to love everyone. That's one of the reasons why uh, one of our church values is that we want to be a home for everyone because we are called to love every person. We are called to respect everyone as Jesus does. Now, the second thing that we should keep in mind is being loving is more important than being right. Being loving is more important than being right. Uh, friends, we might think that we have the right answer, that we know the truth, we know God's way, we know the right way, but if we fail to consider the needs of others in how we discuss controversial topics like this one, we may be right, but we could still lose the battle. Right? Speaking sarcastically uh, to others while we think other people aren't listening or sharing snide comments under your breath about these issues when you think others aren't listening eventually gets back to people. 
And when that happens, the reality is they're going to start to see us as the enemy. And if that happens, right, if we hurt people, if we break their trust, we could end up losing those relationships with people. And then even if we're right, even if we're right, we lose because we've lost that relationship and the opportunity to lead them to Jesus and help them see the truth in love. Right? Jesus, we need to remember that Jesus is the one who changes hearts. Jesus is the one who changes lives, not us. And so we can have these difficult discussions, but we need to do so gracefully with love and respect for all people. Now, with that said, we do also need to understand that loving and respecting others does not mean blind acceptance or agreement with their views and what they do. Uh, that is one of the lies that is told in our culture. Uh, when my niece was in elementary school, she was asked her thoughts on gay marriage, and she responded saying that she wasn't sure that she was still thinking about it. Well, her teacher at that time actually called her out in front of the entire class. Right? The teacher called her a bigot and a homophobe, and that uh, she basically bullied her. And that incident affected her so deeply that she now identifies as bisexual even though she has only ever had boyfriends, but she identifies that way because she doesn't want to be seen as discriminating against anyone. Friends, that's not love, right? Bullying someone into agreement isn't loving, just as accepting a sexual orientation or gender identity that might be harmful isn't loving either. When John described how Jesus came to show us the love of God, he wrote about Jesus saying that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Right? As we read earlier, God is love. And because Jesus is God, that means that Jesus is also love. And, and in that love, he expresses that by being 100% grace and 100% truth. Now, if you're not sure what those words really are, grace is simply the generous love of Jesus. And it refers to all that Jesus gives us that we don't deserve. Truth, on the other hand, refers to the correcting love of Jesus as he helps us face the reality of our sin. The reality that Jesus needed to die for us. Also the reality that we need to change because our sin hurts ourselves and it hurts other people. And we can negatively impact lives in a big way. And so one of the most loving things we can do is to point people to Jesus and help them know the truth of God's instructions in a gracious way. And so friends, that's what this series is all about. We believe that God made us. Right? He made everything and he loves us. He has designed everything in creation. And that includes everything to do with sex and gender. Right? He designed it all for our good. And so we should want to know his instructions in these areas so that we can embrace his love in our lives and help others do the same. And so with that said... Today, we are going to start with the per first part of SOGI, the S-O, and look at why sexual orientation matters. Now, if you haven't heard that term or that phrase, sexual orientation, uh, it's simply an umbrella term that includes all of the different patterns of a person's romantic or sexual attraction and practice. Uh, it describes uh, who someone is attracted to and how they live out their sexuality. Uh, now, in our culture, the list of different sexual orientations seems to keep growing. It seems sometimes like it's growing daily. However, I want to list just a few of the main ones that are included in the letters of LGBTQ+. Uh, so first we have the L. Uh, that stands for lesbian. Traditionally, that meant uh, a, a women with women, 
right? That, that's what it stood for. Uh, however, it's not so straightforward nowadays because nowadays with uh, all, all the discussion around gender identity, there are men identifying as women and when they identify as women and sleep with other women, they're saying that that's a lesbian relationship as well. So it's getting a little bit more confusing. Uh, the G uh, stands for gay and has traditionally been men with men, but also has the same issues uh, with gender as does the lesbian side of things. The B stands for bisexual, uh, which uh, has or used to be men or women with both men and women, not at the same time, but willing to be romantically involved and sleep with both men and women. But again, with the... Uh, with our culture recognizing more than two genders, that does, or sorry, it does include or has been defined as uh, attraction towards simply multiple genders. Uh, that's where things kind of stop. The T stands for transgender, which is more of a gender identity, and the Q stands for queer, which is, again, more of an umbrella term. However, as part of the plus in LGBTQ+, plus, there's also pansexual. Uh, where with the belief that there are more than two genders, people uh, who are pansexual are attracted to and willing to have sex with all genders. There's also polyamorous, uh, which are people who are engaged in relationships where there are more than two people in the relationship, uh, similar to polygamy, although they are not official marriages. Uh, there's also asexual, which uh, describes somebody who's attracted to no one and so usually doesn't live out their attraction in any way or practice. Uh, and although it's not included in the LGBTQ plus letters, there's heterosexuality, uh, which is, uh, yeah, a man with a woman, a biological man with a biological woman. Uh, now, these are just some of the main ones that are out there. Uh, there are other orientations and practices that we might mention later. However, these are usually considered the more well-known ones. Now friends, if we're serious about wanting to know why sexual orientation matters, then we need to start by looking to God and what he says in his word. Because he's the one ultimately who designed sex and gave it to us as a gift. And so if we go back to the very beginning of the Bible, uh, the first book of the Bible is the book of Genesis. And in that book, God defined marriage as the union between one man and one woman for life. And it's within his design for marriage that he says that sex should be enjoyed. Uh, after God made Eve and Adam was absolutely blown away and astounded by her beauty, uh, God said, therefore a man should leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Uh, notice the singularity of a man, his wife, not wives, plural, right? One man, one woman. Uh, there's also a lot that is included in this whole one flesh union that refers to an absolutely incredible intimacy that should be enjoyed within marriage that uh, goes beyond sex. However, it does include sex. And so at the very beginning of the Bible, we see that God designed marriage to be between one man and one woman until death do you part, and sex should only be enjoyed within a monogamous, heterosexual marriage. Now, there are some that have argued that within Scripture, there's a progression, uh, that over time, uh, there seems to be hints or clues that uh, God might allow other sexual orientations like uh, homosexuality and, and other ones, the, like some on the list that we just saw. Uh, for example, it's been argued that David and Jonathan were more than just friends, that they had a romantic relationship, even though there's no clear evidence of this viewpoint uh, in Scripture, besides the two of them having an incredibly close friendship with one another. Uh, when homosexuality is listed as an evil practice within many of the lists in Scripture, such as in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where the Apostle Paul wrote, Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. There are some 
who believe that the original Hebrew and Greek words used for homosexuality are actually a reference for male prostitutes used in occult practices and pagan worship. Uh, Or it could refer to uh, homosexuality, but between a master and a slave. And so they would argue that these passages are referring to the immorality of idolatry and lust and not the practice of homosexuality. Uh, They would also argue that the passages uh, that seem to outright describe homosexuality as sinful have been wrongly interpreted, uh, that they are actually condemning uh, all sexual behavior out of self-seeking lustfulness, but not condemning sacrificial love, which could, according to them, be found in a homosexual relationship. But friends, while any sexual behavior out of self-seeking lustfulness is wrong compared to the sacrificial, self-giving love that Jesus has commanded us to have for each other, there's no way around the consistent message in Scripture that homosexuality and any other form of sexual orientation outside of heterosexual monogamous sex within marriage is wrong. There's just no way around it. That's why homosexuality is always written about negatively in the Bible. Uh, If we trace what God says in the Bible, not what people did, uh, such as the polygamy that we often see in the Old Testament, but if we actually trace what God commanded, we see this reality very clearly. Uh, For example, when God gave the law back in the Old Testament, he said in Leviticus 18.22, Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. The Old Testament law unequivocally forbade homosexuality. In fact, in that time, the punishment uh, for homosexuality was actually death. Uh, It's actually, I think it's a good thing that our culture has changed, that there is grace, that because of Jesus there is forgiveness. But that is a reality that God, from the very beginning, taught and, and uh, commanded against homosexuality. And when we look to Jesus, when we jump forward to the New Testament, anytime he was asked about marriage and sex, he referred back to God's design from the very beginning. For example, when he was asked about divorce, which is so common nowadays in our culture, uh, in Mark 10, he said, at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And so they are no longer two, but one. Again, time after time, Jesus pointed back to the order of creation. Uh, The disciples and followers of Jesus who wrote the rest of the New Testament also wrote uh, negatively about other sexual orientations other other than heterosexual marriage. Uh, One of the more well-known passages in Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul wrote, uh, because of this, which if you look at the previous passage, it's because people chose to worship other things rather than God. God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. Friends, I think that's pretty clear. I mean, Paul explicitly described lesbian women and gay men But then he also gave a blanket description of how because people had rejected God, God allowed people to think up even more detestable things and live them out, right? Doing what ought not to be done. And so in writing this, Paul did not allow any wiggle room to approve any other sexual orientation outside of God's design for sex within marriage. Now, let me just reiterate, we are talking about the practice, we are talking about the lifestyle, we are not talking about the people. We are still called to love people, we are still called to value people, but we are looking at 
the orientation and the practice according to God's word. And so God unilaterally condemns homosexuality. Again, he doesn't condemn homosexuals. He condemns homosexuality and any other form of sexual orientation and practice outside of a monogamous heterosexual marriage. And friends, he did so for good reason. Uh, When we take a close look at what happens when we use and abuse the good gift that God has given to us within sex and marriage, it's clear that people get hurt, that it often leads to pain and devastation. Let me just give you a few examples of how not following God's design for marriage and sex has led to pain and devastation uh, within our culture and within our world. First, our culture's way of sex and marriage uh, often leads to betrayal and broken relationships. It often leads to betrayal and broken relationships. Uh, Sleeping around and having multiple partners, uh, turning sex into a fun activity rather than a way of knowing someone more deeply and serving them uh, actually makes people see others as objects, not as valuable people. Right? It causes people to uh, belittle and, and, and lower the value of others, seeing other people as simply a way to be self-gratified. Uh, and just to be clear, statistically, the community that sleeps around and has the most multiple partners is the LGBTQ plus and pride community. Uh, A group of researchers from Bowling Green State University in Ohio pulled 14,000 individuals looking at trends based on whether uh, they were in heterosexual relationships, male same-sex relationships, or female same-sex relationships. And what they found was that same-sex couples consistently reported shorter relationship lengths and more partners compared to heterosexual couples. And so that alone shows that there's less faithfulness in same-sex relationships, revealing a greater amount of using and discarding people, right? of of hurting people rather than loving people. Uh, Other forms of sexuality are also more likely to lead to disease and death. Uh, Homosexuality and having multiple partners uh, is the major cause of sexually transmitted diseases and infections being spread. In a National Library of Medicine journal article titled HIV is a story first written on the bodies of gay and bisexual men, the authors state that sexual orientation continues uh, to shape the HIV epidemic in the United States and around the world with new infections disproportionately affecting men who have sex with men. They went on to write that globally, from 2010 to 2019, HIV diagnoses increased by 25% among gay and bisexual men, even as infections in other groups declined. And in the United States, gay and bisexual men make up nearly 70% of all new HIV diagnoses each year, even though they make up less than 5% of the population. Uh, If you're not familiar, HIV is the virus that causes AIDS. Uh, And when gay and bisexual men have multiple partners, which they are more likely to do so, uh, they uh, they are also more likely to spread HIV to others. Uh, and, and sadly, friends, uh, this is true of other sexually transmitted infections as well. Uh, according to our own federal government's website, across Canada, infectious syphilis rates are on the rise, and the majority of infections are among gay and bisexual men. Uh, another study published in the National Library of Medicine on the prevalence of hepatitis B and C in the LGBTQ community concluded that the prevalence of hep B and hep C are higher in the LGBTQ community compared to the general population. Uh, I wasn't able to grab a great screenshot of that article. That's just the title if you want to look it up. Uh, But the results were kind of scattered throughout the article. Uh, And many of you probably remember back to the end of the uh, COVID pandemic uh, when there was a media frenzy around what many thought was a new pandemic called monkeypox. 
Uh, that is until the medical community recognized that over 96% of those affected with monkeypox were from the LGBTQ community and that it was actually a new sexually transmitted infection. Uh, one last reason I'll share of why God takes sex and marriage so seriously is because when we compromise a little bit on what God has said and what he has designed for sex and marriage, we end up compromising even more. Uh, you might have heard of the whole slippery slope analogy that once you take one step down the slippery slope, it's easy to keep on going. Uh, an example of this is this past March in Australia, a sex educator taught a grade nine class about bestiality, about having sex with animals in a positive and affirming way. And friends, this should concern us here in Canada because our country is very similar to Australia and what happens in Australia often ends up happening here just at a slightly later date. Uh, we're also seeing an overt effort to change the perception on pedophilia. Uh, pedophiles who are adults who illegally have sex with children are now being referred to as minor attracted individuals trying to make it sound less horrible and normalize the practice of adults having sex with children. I know it's not fun stuff to think about and consider, but this is the reality of our culture today. This is what is being taught in our school system often. Um, I know some of our youth leaders can share some of the stories that we're hearing from the teenagers about having things like litter boxes in the, the, the kids' bathrooms at the high school of, you know, kids acting like animals or kids engaging in other kinds of practices that's not only being celebrated, but it's even being taught, I would even say being pushed through our school system. So friends, we need to recognize that there are a lot of negatives when we don't follow God's instructions However, God is even more protective about marriage and sex uh, because of what marriage actually reveals to us. You see, even though marriage was created for reproduction and enjoyment, it was also given to us as a living illustration of what our relationship with God, our relationship with Jesus can be like. Uh, the Apostle Paul is probably the most well-known uh, writer who wrote about this in Scripture. Uh, and he wrote uh, at length about this connection in Ephesians chapter 5. I'm just going to read a few verses for you. In Ephesians 5, it says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, ladies, please don't run out of the room on me just yet. Uh, because if you think that's going a little bit too far, uh, just look at what Jesus expects of husbands. In the next three verses, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And so according to Paul, wives are to submit to their husbands as we as we as individuals who make up the church are to submit to Jesus. And husbands, husbands, we are to love our wives in the same way that Jesus has loved each and every one of us and has given himself for us, even laying his life down for us. Now please, don't get caught up on these aspects of submission and headship or leadership within the home. Uh, we simply don't have time to get into all of the nuances of these realities. But the main point that Paul is trying to make is that marriage, as God designed it, is a tangible picture of what our relationship with Jesus should look like. And so let's just take a, a few moments 
and think about God's design for marriage of one man with one woman for life. I, I want you to imagine for a moment, maybe there's somebody specific that you can even think of, but imagine a, a, you know, an, a little old couple. All right, they're usually little because they shrink over time, but just a, a, a mad, hey, I know it's true. It's already happening to me, okay? But imagine a, a little old couple who have got, gone through countless ups and downs. They've endured all kinds of struggles through life together, and they are celebrating their 60th anniversary, right? Some of you know couples like that. Some of you might even be in couples like that. It's absolutely amazing. But I want us to just take a few minutes and, and ask ourselves, like, what are some of the realities do you think that they have experienced in a, a good relationship like that? We're going to assume it's been a good 60 years, okay? But what are some of the realities that they have experienced over those 60 years? Take a few minutes, talk about those realities around your table, and then we'll come back together and keep going. All right, I hear some great discussion and uh, some laughter, so that's great. Hopefully this has been a, a positive discussion. Remember, it was a happy 60 years, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean that there weren't, you know, challenges and hardships and struggles, but, you know, they stuck it through together. Uh, and, and, yeah, I mean, after 60 years together, I'm sure a couple like this would have had tons of stories and, and experiences to share. Um, and, and they would have, you know, that would also reflect on, right, what our relationship with Jesus is like. And so I'm, I'm just going to highlight maybe a, a few that we might have mentioned at our tables and, and how that relates to our relationship with Jesus. Uh, so this uh, older couple, they might talk about the children that they had, you know, how those children went on to have their own lives and their own children. And, you know, by the time you're hitting the 60th anniversary, maybe they even have great grandchildren, right? Like just an absolutely beautiful family uh, that continues to grow. 
Uh, well, their relationship and their love for one another led to new life, right? It led to future generations. And that's similar to how we gain new life through our relationship with Jesus, right? We gain new life because of Christ. Jesus died and rose again so that we could have new life and that we could uh, have eternal life with him. Uh, In fact, Jesus actually referred to this eternal life and this change of going from death to life as being born again. When Jesus was talking to uh, Nicodemus, who was one of the religious leaders of his time, uh, Jesus said to him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And he wasn't talking about another physical birth. And Nicodemus asked that, like, how does an old man go back inside of his mother and get born again? No, he was talking about a, a spiritual birth, right? That there needs to be not only a physical birth, but a spiritual birth. And so just as marriage often leads to new life in children and grandchildren, so does a relationship with Jesus. Uh, If we go back to that old couple again, they probably would talk about or, or reveal through their interactions with each other an incredible intimacy of knowing probably almost everything about each other. Right? It's, it's almost like they're one being just constantly working fluidly with one another. Uh, and of course, this intimacy is more than just sex. It would be a loving and valuing of each other with all of each other's quirks and differences where they would have learned how to work together and relate to one another like perfectly. Friends, that's the kind of relationship that Jesus wants to have with us, but even more so. Right? Jesus wants to have an incredibly close relationship with every single one of us. Uh, he already knows everything about us, and he loves us completely. So much so that Jesus came and died for us. Right, So we know the extent and just how amazing his love is for us. But Jesus also wants us to know and love him. And he wants us to know him more and more. Uh, Psalm 139, we're not going to read it, but it's a beautiful description of how Jesus knows everything about us, and he challenges us and encourages us to seek after him. In Jeremiah 29, verse 13, the Lord said, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, with all your heart. And so friends, Jesus knows you, but he also wants to be known by you. Right? Just as a husband and wife should seek to know each other more and more each day. Well, the old couple probably would also talk about the struggles that they endured and the hardships that they went through together, but also of how they were able to keep going because they knew that they had each other's backs. Right? That divorce wasn't an option, that they are in it together for life. Right? They would have built an incredible trust in each other over the years because they were faithful to each other and s- chose to stick it out no matter what came their way. And friends, in the same way, Jesus is faithful to us. He is completely trustworthy, and he's never broken a promise. And so when he says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, you can trust that he will always be faithful to you. You can trust that he will always be there for you. But he also wants us to be faithful to him. Just as the husband and wife relationship is a two-way relationship, so is our relationship with Jesus. And so he wants us to be faithful to him. Uh, Friends, our our time is short. um, And so I just want to wrap up by saying the the correlations between marriage and our relationship with Jesus are, are vast. We could talk about this for for weeks, months, maybe even years. Uh, And I wish that we could explore these connections further, but it's this relationship in marriage, right? This relationship in marriage that we see and get a glimpse of what our relationship with Jesus can be like. That's why God loves us and wants us to come to him and why he is so protective of marriage. I mean, yes, God wants you to have a fulfilling marriage and a wonderful sex life, 
right? That's why he gave us these gifts. He wants you to enjoy the pleasure of your spouse's body. He wants you to have children and wonderful, supportive, and intimate relationships. But most importantly, he wants you to know him. He wants you to trust him. And he wants you to follow him. Uh, We're going to look at this aspect of that relationship with God in more detail next week. But friends, if you're struggling with sexual desires and practices that go against God's design for sex, you need to know first and foremost that he loves you. He loves you. Jesus died for you. He laid down his life for every single one of us. And he also wants what's best for you. He truly does want you to have a fulfilling, a meaningful, and a purposeful life in following his instructions. Uh, But if you are struggling with desires that feel like they're beyond your control, uh, and you don't think that you'll ever be able to overcome those temptations, uh, know that God can help you. God can help you. In 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul wrote that no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now friends, if Paul stopped there, I would probably give up. I would probably throw in the towel because it seems that God has more faith in me than I have in myself. I've messed up many times. I've given into temptation more times than I can count. I'm not proud of it, but that's just the reality of our sinful, fallen nature. But that's why Paul went on to clarify and say, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Friends, God can give you the strength to overcome whatever struggles and temptations you're facing. Even if it's just in that moment and you're like, I'm about to give in, God, I need a way out. The simple fact of turning and looking to him is all it takes. And God will often provide, not often, he promises to provide that way out. But we have to choose to take it. We have to choose to take it. And so friends, you have to be open and honest with Jesus. You have to be humble, taking whatever help he gives you, even if that means uh, asking for the help of others, right? Even if that means being vulnerable, sharing your struggles with a family member or friend and asking them to keep you on track. Oftentimes, God works in our lives through other people, through the people around us. And so we might have to be humble. We might have to be willing to ask for help to rely on others, but to also make ourselves available so that others will rely or can rely on us. But friends, if this is you, if you're struggling with these desires, if you're struggling with things that you know that's not what God wants for me, know that God can help you and that you can do it through his power and his strength. Now, friends, if you're a family member or friend of someone in the LGBTQ community, Let me just encourage you to keep loving them. Keep loving them. Keep being there for them. Don't compromise on the the truth or give your approval or acceptance of what they're doing, which may enable their behavior. But also don't be judgy and don't constantly criticize them. Right? Sacrificially love them. Give yourself for them. And ask God to give you the strength to keep loving them even though it might be difficult. Friends, also pray for the opportunity uh, to graciously share the good news of Jesus with them uh, and uh, God's love for them. Ask God for the opportunity to share your convictions and what you believe God's word says uh, for his design for sex and marriage. And just so you know, this this is a battle, right? This is a, a big deal. It may take months, years, even decades for God to slowly work on an individual's heart through you. But if you love them as God loves them, then it's worth it. 
Uh, as for those of you who are maybe looking at me skeptically, who disagree with me, maybe you're feeling a little bit angry towards me, or if you don't think I've covered things uh, fairly or fully, maybe if you even just have more questions, uh, just know I, I'm more than happy to go deeper on this topic with you. Uh, we are always confined by time. Uh, and I know I've already gone way over. So if you want to talk with me, come up to me after the service. I'm more than happy to talk. Or if you want to have a conversation later this week or in the weeks to come, uh, just give me a shout. We'll schedule an appointment and we will uh, talk together. Uh, but friends, this is an important topic. Uh, this is one of the battles of our time. Uh, it's a battle of what's right and good. It's a battle against the destruction of lives and relationships. It's a battle for souls. And we need to stand for the truth out of love for our culture and the people in our community, in our city, and across our nation. But let me also remind you that we don't stand and fight this battle in the same way that the world fights. 2 Corinthians 10, Paul wrote, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pre pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And so friends, first, we fight the battle in our own lives. Right? We fight the battle in our own minds and in our own hearts, taking every thought captive to the Word of God and making each thought obedient to Jesus. But we also fight for others. Right? We fight the battle with God's power using God's truth, and we fight the battle with love, hoping that those that reject God and His way for sex and marriage will one day trust in Jesus that they will one day join his family, and that they will experience the freedom and life that he can give. Would you pray with me? Father, this is a tough one. And I know for some, uh, for some it might be, yeah, heard this, been there, done that, uh, just nodding along in ag agreement. For others, it's a... It's a mix of emotions with family members and friends or, or even uh, ourselves personally struggling with some of these things. Uh, God, it's a wrestle. It is a battle. And we need your help. Uh, this battle is dividing families and friends. It's dividing uh, groups. It's dividing our community, our, our city. It's dividing our nation. And Lord, when we don't listen to you, when we don't follow your instructions, oh, it brings so much pain. It brings so much heartache and, and misery. It brings death and destruction. And so God, we, we pray for resurgence of your word in our community. We pray that the, the good news and the truth of Jesus uh, not only of how people can be saved, but also for how you want us to live our lives, that we would get that truth out there. That people would see the light of your word more and more. But God, we know that we're also challenged to do this with grace and with love. And so Lord, help us to be a people of love. Help us to be a people of grace and truth. To emulate you. And to show people that no matter what they decide, we're going to love and accept them. We're going to welcome them. We're going to walk alongside of them and support them. In the hopes that one day they will turn to you and be saved. Lord, change and transform our hearts and our minds. Change and transform our community, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.